What's up guys? Welcome back. My name is John John the Wise and I got another cyberpunk video for you guys. This is episode three of our Patreon exclusive series and we're going to be talking about world building. But before we get into that, make sure you guys join that Discord community. It's a community of like-minded people loving Cyberpunk 2020, Red, and anything involved with tabletop gaming. We just want to connect with you and give you a place to have a safe conversation about Cyberpunk. And make sure you guys follow me on social media, at John John the Wise on all the platforms. You can find me everywhere. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the podcast tabletop cyberpunk it's a podcast where i talk about cyberpunk i have guests on and i have all kinds of goodies as well and last but not least make sure you guys join the patreon if you're already a part of it then you're watching this video if you're not then you are watching this video in the future and you would have already had been watching this video if you had joined the patreon at patreon.com slash john john the wise where i have all kinds of exclusive content and my patreon only games coming up so if you want to be a part of that, make sure you guys join. All right, now let's get straight into this video. Now, before we start, I want to make sure that you guys know that over preparation is what probably the worst thing that you can do as a game master. The reason it's so bad is because there's going to be so many things that you've done in your world building and your preparation that you're like, oh, I got to remember it. I got to have my tables. I got to have my charts. You have all these things put together and you're going to overwhelm your mind. And an overwhelmed mind is not going to be good at improvisation, is not going to be good at remembering things, and you just will, it's like a failure to launch. It's happened to me, it's happened to many game masters, it's up to you how you want to run your game, no one should ever tell you how to run your game, but if I could give you one piece of advice, is while we're doing this world building and preparation, do not mistake this for the amount of preparation you need to do for each session this kind of preparation is all the stuff that you do before your epic campaign can begin so if you want to start your epic campaign you do a bunch of work in the beginning like the these videos that i'm showing you guys you do all this work and once you're ready with all that work then we can move on to doing our epic campaign all right, so the first piece of world building that you're probably going to do is not gangs, it's not names, although all those things will probably have come to you as an inspiration in the first place. But if you want to have a story, you got to know where it takes place. You got to know if it's in a city or if it's in a town, and that's where we get to the where. Where is the place that we are going to start this epic campaign? Where will it go? Where are the places that we can potentially go to? And these are all ideas that you should be putting down on paper, not too too in depth. You don't have to go crazy into all of the, the places. But if there's one main area like Night City or the Amber Oasis in my in my campaign, then those places need to feel like they're they, they have to be defined. Remember that your setting is like a character. If you treat your setting like a character, then you'll know that it needs to evolve, it needs to change, and aspects of it are different than other places on the map because this is the place that your characters are going to be interacting the most. You want to make sure you have that down before anything else. Now, what is it about this setting that makes it a cyberpunk setting? Is it the technology? Is it the destitute wasteland? What is it about this setting that screams cyberpunk? If it was a character, what aspects do we need to add to this character to make it feel like it's cyberpunk? And finally, how big is this setting? How important is the infrastructure? How powerful are the police? How powerful are the gangs? How big is it in scope as far as what what difference can it make within the world is it comparable to other big cities is it less than other cities is it more like a town than it is a city these are all decisions you should make on the scope of how big this place can be how much of the location can the players feasibly explore without getting bored of the place are there neighboring areas that are just as big or maybe slightly smaller or is it like one giant island where the outside world cannot really interact with it and it's really kind of like an insulated place 
and how much of an impact can your players make while they're in this setting? That's a big important question that you should be asking as well. In a place like Night City, you feel like an ant in an ant farm, just moving around, doing things. You're never going to topple the corporations. You can only inconvenience them and mess with their plans. But they're always going to be big. They're always going to be giant. And Night City is just too big of a place for you to make a lasting impact. Or maybe it is within your crazy campaign. How should the players feel like they can impact the world around them? That's what's important about your setting. Next, let's talk about factions. So now that you have your place and you know exactly where it's going to take place in your story, you want to talk about the various factions that are within this setting. I personally like to break down factions in some sort of structure. Structure is a template that you can use and it is a way to give you an idea of how these factions can interact with each other if you need this faction and that faction to interact with each other somehow. You can't plan for everything, but your players might even make up a faction on the spot, and you have to have some kind of way where they can puzzle piece together and interact with each other. So if you have a structure and you have some kind of outline that you can use as a template, that's what I usually use so I can figure out how these factions interact with each other. So the first part of the faction structure that's important to me is how powerful are they? And I'm not just talking about how many guns they have or how many people that use the guns. I'm talking about how much influence do they have? How much of a lasting impact do they make around the world or, or around their neighborhood, or in their community? These are all important things. So like, for example, the police might have like a power eight, but a booster gang has a power three. Now, can a booster gang defeat the police? Yeah, I'm sure that they can defeat them in some kind of small-time warfare. But if the police bring all their combined efforts and go after this one booster gang, there's no way that they would stand a chance. That's because we have created this structure of figuring out who's more powerful, where does the buck stop, and what's an easy fight and a dangerous fight. Next, let's talk about this faction's history. We want to talk about small things. You don't want to go too in-depth. You don't want to write an entire essay because, remember, over-preparation is a silent killer. Instead, you just want to write down a few sentences, one paragraph, two max, if you just can't resist writing two paragraphs. Write two paragraphs maximum of the history of this place, how it started, where it's going, where it is now, and something that's quirky and fun about it that makes it a unique organization. Lastly, what I usually like to do is I like to write down any notable members, leaders, lieutenants, henchmen, specialists, anybody that is an important part of this faction and really embodies this faction. That way, when my players have to interact with them and let's say they want to interact with the booster gang and they want a drug dealer, I have a drug dealer. I have a guy that knows a drug dealer or knows where to find drugs. And that's important to have. You don't want to go, like I said, too in depth. You just want to name what their specialization is and how they're connected to this faction. And these are notable members. There's going to be other members. You can make them on the spot. They're going to be a part of this faction but these are the most notable members of this group and they really embody what this faction is all about. All right, let's talk about allied factions. Now that we have structure, we can begin to use this template to bring down allied factions, enemy factions, and neutral factions. With your allied factions, these are people that the players can look to for resources, for trust, and for anything that they need to interact with your world. The structure of these allies is very good uh, information for the players to know. They should know exactly how powerful they are, the notable members, maybe not exactly each one, but if the, if there's an allied group that is going to be working closely with the players, I would give them some sort of handout and say, hey, look, take a look at this. This is what their organization is about. Just in case you need to have that in your back pocket to help you. And allied factions are a small bit of safety for the players. They're people that the players can trust and go to in a dark future where trust is something that you don't really come by. Allied factions are also a really great way to guide your players into overcoming whatever obstacles they need to overcome or to find the plot points necessary to move the campaign forward. 
These allies will be there. They shouldn't be taking up the spotlight. They should just be there to let the players know that they're not alone unless you really want them to be alone. Neutral factions is what we're going to be talking about next. And these are everybody else. They're not the enemies. They're not the allies. They're everybody else. They're the shopkeepers. They're the cops that pull you over. They're the woman that's getting mugged on the corner of the street. These are everybody in the world. And they're really just role play opportunities for your players. And they're kind of like buffers in between the action. As far as structure goes for neutral people, I usually don't even write down that many things. I don't write down power, I don't write down notable members, or anything like that. Because honestly, there's so many people and they're so vast, and these are all the NPCs that I'm going to probably be making on the fly. There is no need for me to decide how many family members they have, what kind of gun they have on their hip, or anything. It's all just stuff that you come up with on the spot, unless the one thing that happens, which the players find a liking to this NPC and they become a potential ally or they become a potential enemy because of the opposite had happened. Something had happened where they don't like this NPC and now this NPC needs to die. Well, these are potential people that can become allies and enemies. And if you spend too much time trying to flesh them out, then the players are just going to throw away all your plans and change them for themselves. And you should never be married to any of these NPCs. These are people that come and go and probably will never be seen again unless your players have dictated that these are important NPCs, whether they're bad or good or neutral. The players will tell you exactly what to do with these NPCs. And the final factions are enemy factions. Now, these are really important for you to prep in because the players are probably never going to see these writeouts. They're not going to see this kind of stuff. This is all for you. So you want to make sure that you have their structure really intact where you know exactly how powerful they are, how they influence the world around them, their agendas, and what they want to get done while they're living in your world. You really want to lock down how they behave. How do they behave in the world around them because of their motivations and the agendas that they have? These enemies have some, it's like their own campaign is going on in the back of what's going on with your players. And you can't focus too much on them as far as game time. But when it comes to your preparation, that's when you start concocting what these enemies are doing behind the scenes. The players will give you hints and clues on exactly how they want these factions to operate. It's really weird. They kind of mirror and tell you like, oh, these guys are the ones that send the assassins after us, right? Well, I guess that's what they do now since the players have that inkling feeling of it. Send assassins after them. That might not have been a part of your prep, but it is now. While the allied factions' resources are important, the enemy's resources are really just resources against the players. I don't need to know how many AV4s Arasaka has. I just need to know how many AV4s are in the area to deal with the players or how powerful the AV4s are and what kind of guns they have on them and stuff like that just in case the players get into an altercation. That's more important than the exact number and different make and model and stuff like that. You want to figure out what resources the enemies can use against the players more than what resources they have in general. Now I'm going to show you guys a few examples of how I have enemies, allies, and neutral factions in my world and how I have structured them. I'll give you guys a look on the computer on exactly how I do stuff like that and maybe it'll give you guys an idea. All right guys, I wanted to give you guys an example of my world building techniques or exactly how I do my world building. So I'm going to show you guys the different various ways that I do things because there isn't one defined way that I do it. And I want to make sure that you guys can see that there shouldn't be one way to do things. You should do things in all kinds of ways, evolve, change things. And I'm going to show you that process. So this is a random excerpt from my last campaign that I did with the wise guys. It says one shot to ancient Texas, but it's not, it wasn't a one shot. It ended up being a full blown campaign. So I want to direct your attention to this one area right here, the Austin Atrocity 
party gang that's graduating to kidnapping. Now, the reason I want to show you guys this is because this is the only piece of world building I did for this faction. I did not make anything else for them. And this is, these are my notes for my campaign. As I'm going through my campaign, I look at these notes and I just made sure that I told myself that these the Austin atrocity were going to be there, that they were going to be in that area and the players were probably going to interact with them. Now, what's important about this is the players kind of took a liking to this gang. They liked how they behaved. They liked how they reacted and they wanted to know more about them. They even joined them in combat in this warehouse fight that went on and that was actually one of the lost episodes for the wise guys so i decided after that point that okay i would need to flesh these guys out a little bit more and that's where i came up with this and as i spoke about earlier in this video i talked about structure now in this uh i tried to make myself a little bit of a template i think i went a little bit too deep and i'll explain to you guys why so here is the austin atrocity i wrote down when they were established their aliases, how many members they have, ethnicity, what type of gang, their reputation on the street. And this this number will also help me in dice rolling if I need to roll a uh, face down or, or, or reputation or anything like that. What's their specialization? Kidnapping, theft, drugs, contraband, blah, blah, blah. And where's their territory? Okay. Now, this all this covers history and also covers anything important about the gang. The when they were established never came up once. Players don't even care. Aliases never came up once. They're called the atrocity. Members, I wrote 20 to 35. The players have interacted with like five or six. Having more than that just makes it seem like, who are these guys? Who are these people? So this shouldn't even say 20 to 35. It should say six, five or six members. Ethnicity mixed. That came across, that's actually something that was notable, but it wasn't something that the players really touched on. It was just something that I had in my mind as I was playing with this, uh, this group. Type, this was important. What type of gang were they? They were a party gang, combat gang. I kind of switched them up to be more of a combat gang after what happened in the campaign because they came up on a bunch of guns and goodies and stuff like that. Street reputation is important if I need to use that. I wrote down Austin, Texas as a caveat. Specialization, none of this ever came up except for fencing goods and contraband and drugs, actually. These, these three were the main things that the players were interested in. Anything else they didn't, they could really give a shit about. Territory, this was actually important because we needed to know where they hang out and the players wanted to go and rest there so they can continue on with the campaign. And uh, that's what they did. They went to their hideout, which is the Jackalope Bar, a real bar in Austin. And uh, that's where I decided their territory would be. Now, this next area was actually way more important as far as, here we go, we have the leader, Alina Sharpie Lopez, founder of the gang. I wrote a little bit of history of how she started the gang and stuff like that. But uh, after that, I got lieutenants, sniper, female, arm specialist, flex, male, muscle, bodyguard, dog, non-binary, tracker, kidnapping expert. I just made sure that I wrote down some, uh, some quirky like words here and there, arm specialist, bodyguard, kidnapping expert. These are all just ideas to give me about this character and what their motivations are. If somebody's a kidnapping expert, there's things that they find more important than someone who's an arm specialist would find more important. And that's all I wanted to do with my world building. I don't want to go too in depth. I don't need to know where dog got his training or, th or their training. I don't need to know where the where sniper got her training and how she became an arm specialist. All that stuff might come up later if the players care about it and they want to know, then I'll make the effort. But if they don't want to know and they don't tell me anything about it, then I don't care, to be honest. All right. And then uh, down here, I wrote more notable members. All these members were just too much. It was good to have them here because I knew that the players were going to be interacting with them. But if you're going to be doing a bunch of campaign, a bunch of gangs and a bunch of people, then uh, I would say do less. So even though all this stuff was on one page, and as you can see, I wrote some skills here, some skills that uh, I think that these notable members might be good at. 
and I put a number to it, so it's like one d six, one d ten plus whatever five and five and and whatever. This is these are just numbers that I wrote down, so I can say that these members, uh, this is what their specialization is. Now, uh, this is one one page. It's not that much. It's not crazy. The players can read all of this in literally one sitting and look at it, and it's very easy to read. Now, this gang, the reason I actually even went this far in depth, like I said, the players made them important. The players decided that they were cool and they wanted to hang out with them and go to their hangout and their headquarters. So they decided that these NPCs are more important than they really were. And that's when I needed to make them an ally. They were a neutral party. And I made them an allied party. And then I went through all this stuff. Now that you have all your factions ready to go, now you can go back to your plot chart and start inserting these factions into places where you said bad guys do this, bad guys do that. Well, now the bad guy has a name, they have a location, and you probably got some kind of inspiration on exactly how these bad guys operate. And it might change your plans for the campaign. That's why I usually do this step after the plot charts. But like I said, you might want to do your world building first and then insert your world building into your plot chart once you have all the pieces laid out in front of you. I like doing a general outline, then I do the world building, and then I go back to my general outline and make it more of a specific outline. Names, places, enemies, all allies, neutral factions, all those things are going to be brought back into your plot chart so you can start plotting exactly who's going to be interacting with who and try to plan for the future. Now, remember, I told you that the players are going to be messing this whole thing up. They're going to figure out for themselves that these factions should be interacting with them in specific ways, and they're going to make up their minds about these factions, whether you like it or not. So what I usually like to do is I just... It's not set in stone. Whatever's in the plot chart, whatever's in the world building is just there in case I need ideas, in case there's writer's block, in case we don't know where to go next on this campaign. I have puzzle pieces and ways that I can spice up the campaign because I've done the work beforehand. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If this microphone did not work for you guys, it's a brand new one. I'm sorry. I'm still trying to figure out what direction is perfect and what settings are good with it. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much to all my patrons that have been watching and supporting. I really appreciate you guys. We'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.